Henry Williamson first reached an international audience in 1927 with Tarka the Otter. His stories of wildlife are set on the moors of Devon in the west of England. They're told with deep feeling and they rang true with a generation that had recently survived the Great War of 1914. Williamson himself recreated the life of the trenches and the returning soldier in two novel sequences, The Flax of Dream and Chronicle of Ancient Sunlight. In the 30s, he entered political controversy with support for Sir Oswald Mosley and the extreme right wing. These are the themes Henry Williamson takes up now in conversation with Clive Jordan. Henry Williamson, your book of collected nature stories brings together several books about the people and the animals and the natural life of the West Country, the lonely uplands of Exmoor and Dartmoor. What was your first encounter with this natural world? When did you first come across this part of the world? Just before the war, when I was uh, 16. I went down there by train from Waterloo to North Devon, and the return fare was nine and sixpence. And I spent a fortnight wandering about by myself on the moor and absolutely enchanted. And I came back and uh, a few weeks later the Great War broke out and I was already in the army as a territorial and I went out to Belgium. So when you went back to the West Country after the Second World War, it was something of a return. It wasn't the first encounter. Well, during the war, of course, I'd been quite different. I mean, we were pretty wild people. You know, we had tremendous binges in the mess and all sorts of things. It was all pleasure, 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 uh, you know, in between the battles. And I thought this love of nature had gone forever. But when I came back and was still in the army and was at a demobilization centre at Folkestone, I happened to read in a second-hand bookshop Richard Jeffrey's Story of My Heart, which I suppose he's the finest country writer we've ever had of his particular genre. And that was my genre. And from that moment, I never went on parade again and I was a writer. How much do you think that your great love of nature and your tremendous preoccupation with animals and the countryside after the First World War was a reaction from the war, a sort of process of keeping the world at bay? Well, as a schoolboy in Kent, I was always wandering off on my bicycle and in various places where I had permission to go um, with gamekeepers and others. I simply loved it and I was happy as anything and, as I say, it disappeared in the war and came back with a great rush afterwards and all my boyhood memories were, well, I wouldn't say they were the only basis, but they were a large basis of what I wrote. Was, Do you think the war stimulated this love of nature? No, because in the war I was a different person. It came back suddenly after reading this book by Richard Jeffries. What relationship do these stories have to your other very successful nature stories, Sailor the Salmon and Tarka the Otter, which won you the Hawthornden Prize in the late 1920s? Are well, they from, from exactly the same period, in fact? No, uh, a little bit later. The, uh, Tarka was written in 1926 and seven, about 17 versions, because I didn't know my subject. And then I went all over the rivers, almost with a measuring tape, all over Dartmoor, and Exmoor by myself and made notes of everything. And then when I came to write it, I had been married about uh, 11 months and we had a small son. And this little boy, his mother's very ill in bed, he at three months of age was the same weight as at birth. And in two of those months, I'd been nursing him all night, writing Tarka, while this poor little thing was crying in my arms all the food, it was a bottle, you gave him, he was sick. And the doctor said, shove him in a room and give him a hot water bottle. Let him cry, because this was a time when they thought to cuddle a child would ruin it. The very opposite of was the truth. And I wouldn't, I had him here, and I um, gave him his food and he was sick, and then he'd go to sleep and I'd do one or two words. And that's why so much of Tarka is as a friend of mine said, every word chipped out of the breastbone. Fact, 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 you see. And I might do a page a night. Then about three in the morning, the candle having burnt right out, I'd go upstairs, my eyes shut, all stinging, and this little boy in my arms, hand it over his mother, who was in bed with fever, and sleep. Perhaps your sympathy and your love for your child did get into the story and the tremendous sympathy for 
the otter. It did in the little uh, cub of Tarka that was frozen in the great winter. Do you remember? Tarka is on this old swan's nest, the tiny little thing. And his mother, Grey Muzzle, is an old mother and an old, old bitch. And this little baby hadn't got enough milk and he just was frozen up. And she later was frozen up when the river froze. And when I'd written all these things in Tarkins, all the, the devil fish and things like that, I found out afterwards that they had happened there exactly as I wrote them, but a long time ago, an old doctor told me. He said, you must have known about it. I said, no, I imagined it. Because I could feel all this, this thing in my blood. Because my mother's family, you see, a, a long time on Exmoor, and felt, I think, the earliest known one of the Shapkas is about 1015, before the Normans came. And I think possibly the genes are in my blood. Because when I first went on Exmoor, this boy, just before the war, I mean, I almost cried when I left. I said, goodbye, Heather, I'm coming back. And I felt all like this, you see, and I did come back. And now I think, and I've always thought, that the writing that you do when you're on the right beam is almost automatic. You are a medium for it, and you mustn't muck about with that talent. Well, you bring back to, to me talking uh, a tremendous picture of that period long ago, that awful, horrific period of trench warfare. But it took you some time to put this into your novels. Um, in fact, not until your Chronicle of Ancient Sunlight sequence, which you started publishing in 1951. Why did it take you so long to put this into print? Why, why wasn't it, for instance, in the Flax of Dream, your earlier novel sequence? Well, in, in that, Willie, at the end, only uh, talks about the war, and he, of course, very bitter about it, like Sassoon was, and Graves, and uh, the war itself, the actual slaughter, you see, not the comradeship. And I think it was too big for me. And I had ambitions to write something as a historical novel. And I got all the German records, the French records, the English histories, and I read them here and there, and I found wonderful incidents, of course, which weren't uh, mine at all, but I put them in through this hero of Willie Madison, who always looked upon himself as a coward, but really was quite a brave man, particularly when he wasn't when he was thinking of other people, instead of his blooming self, as T. Lawrence called it. But then the war comes to fill five books of your Chronicle of Ancient Sunlight sequence. Um, you discarded the original idea of the historical book by that time. Well, well, when I came to write about 1914, where I was, I did the home front as well, and Philip's relations and characters. It's a sort of foresight saga. And I found that uh, I, was, um, I, was, I was possessed. I was in this hut at night. My little baby was then about uh, eight or nine years of age. He was going to school, in the village school. And I'd start writing at night with this candle. This, this was in your hut in, yes, the, in the fields? Yes, in, 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 in the definitely. 50s, in the early 50s. And I would write and the whole thing would come back, which I thought I'd completely forgotten, and I, I lived in it. And I would write sometimes for 14 hours on end with, you know, moments of stopping for food and tea. And I would go to sleep, perhaps five hours, and wake up with a golden glowing feeling because I'd got the first Battle of Ypres. I've got even that marvellous remark made by the regimental sergeant major of the coal stream in 1914 when the last of his battalion had melted down the Menin Road. They'd thrown away their rifles They'd had no food or sleep for 48 hours, no ammunition. And this is the classic remark of that regimental sergeant major to our adjutant. It'll be a good thing, sir, when this war is over and we can get back to real soldiering. <laughs> it seems from what you're saying that what everybody assumes about A Chronicle of Ancient Sunlight is correct, that it is tremendously autobiographical. There's obviously close links between yourself and the hero, Philip Madison, who went through the war like you, uh, returned to the West Country like you, farmed in Norfolk like mm, you, yeah. uh, and also had your enthusiasm for Sir Oswald Mosley and for yes. political ideals. Sir Harry Wood Birkin, I call him. Indeed, yeah. Yeah. indeed. Um, do you feel that these political and philosophical ideas of yours, which 
were very right-wing, indeed some people even called them fascist, um, rightly or wrongly, that, that these have um, led to a, something of a neglect of this, of this work by the critics. Oh, well, yes, because, you see, it, it, fascism is a dirty word, and uh, what we wanted was to get uh, on with the welfare state. And, of course, Moses' meetings, always the communists, were very keen people and idealistic in their own way. They'd go and smash it up. And there was a terrible lot of fighting and, and disorder, and, and all the traffic was stopped. And, of course, that's why it was stopped by the police, because they had to keep and the authorities, because you couldn't have that sort of civil riot going on. Do you feel bitter about the way um, the world treated you over the ideas in your novel and, indeed, the ideas in no, your life? No, not at all. I understood as a writer, all the other people's point of view. And we were little before our time. We wanted the welfare state. Mosley said, I want wherever you find talent and quality, whether it's in a castle or a cottage, that's where we want it. And he also said a gentleman can live in a cottage and a cad in a castle. In other words, all this business of, of privilege and everything is no good unless you earn your spurs in each generation. That's what he wanted. You but, it, but it wasn't just the welfare state. There was also your enthusiasm for Hitler in the 1930s, whom you described as the great man across the Rhine in a preface to well, one, he, one of your see, books. Well, you see, he put... Uh, after We must remember that Germany, after the war, was in civil war. And I suppose in that civil war fighting, there were very nearly 100,000 communists and national socialists killed. And I was there in the 20s, and it was terrible. The machine guns going, there were pubs being bombed, seven million out of work. You see, that came from the Treaty of Versailles in July 1919, when chunks of Germany were cut off and given to other countries, Poland and everything. And it was then that Foch said, the chap who won the war, he pointed in July 1919 at Danzig on the map and said, that's where the Great War will break out again in 20 years' time. He was wrong. It was 20 years and two months when it broke out again. All that was unjust and wrong, you see. And did, did the war lead you to revise your philosophical ideas? Um, I, well, I, I saw that it had got a very bad war. In fact, um, Lord Hankey once said to me in a private luncheon party, he said, it's a CADS war. The Second War. Yes, you see, I mean, we were bombing as a policy the, the, the civilian population, burning them with phosphorus. And in this book, Lucifer in the End, when Philip feels that everything's gone and he's guilty, he tries hard as a historian to balance, say, the, the bombing of civilians and, with phosphorus and everything with those terrible, with the horror of the concentration camps. The idea being that if we're going to have a new Europe, a brave new Europe, Everybody's got to look first at their own faults and not point at their neighbour. In fact, that's Christianity. How far do you think we've got now towards that brave new Europe, which indeed Philip Madison is still aspiring towards in the last book, The, uh, the Gale of the World? I, sh I should think that... Well, you see, I'm an optimist. As Richard Jeffries, who died young of terrible pain and everything, he said, in spite of my experiences, I remain an optimist, and so do I. And I just hope that... Because I see mankind as one whole now, the colour and race and everything. They're just uh, the effects of the climate. Henry Williamson, thank you very much. Henry Williamson was talking to Clive Jordan. Profile is a production of the British Broadcasting Corporation in London.